Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Joy J. Moore. The text for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost, which falls on July 16, 2023, are from Isaiah chapter 55, verses 10 through 13. Our alternate first reading, Genesis chapter 25, 19 through 34. Our psalm is 65, optional verses 1 through 8, but then 9 through 13. We continue our journey through Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. And we also continue our reading in Matthew chapter 13, 1 through 9. Then we skip some verses and we do 18 through 23. Parable of the Sower. Mm. and its explanation. We also, this is three Sundays in a row with parables from Matthew. Mm -hmm. Yes. And we are, yes. And so really what all of chapter 17 is like seven parables, right? I mean, chapter 13 is like seven parables. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So parable time. So the humorous me wants to just a, a, a acknowledge that I need you need to give the disciples a break on this one. Um, I'm from the city. I don't get stuff about farming. And so I need these kinds of things explained. And these guys were fishermen. So, yeah, <laughs> of course they had to go like, yeah, yeah, I get that. I get that. But when we get home, Jesus, you're going to have to explain that on the way home in the car. I don't know. <laughs> So, so give them a break for not understanding. They weren't farmers, but I do love the fact that Jesus spoke to all the people, that Jesus used stories and parables to reach a wide group of people out of their life experience. And we as preachers should do the same, all, all joking aside. Yeah. Well, and with this parable, I think, you know, it, what is at the end of the day, what is uh, just the truth of of the reality of what the sower sows and where the where the seeds end up uh, is that three quarters of what is sown doesn't come to fruition, <laughs> and there's something to I think maybe ponder that a little bit uh, as a preacher. For you know, for the preacher this week, just to think about uh, the the odds are that a lot of what we preach and a lot of what we what what gets uh, what gets heard is not necessarily going to have the kind of um, result <laughs> perhaps that we want uh, or that we intend. And uh, there is some, I don't know there is something about that kind of um, pondering that reality. Right, uh, that we, uh, that we. I, I've always, well, you and I, when we teach preaching, joy, we talk about, and I've grown to use this now a lot when I talk about sermons and when I talk about preaching. That our job as preachers uh, is not to be a good preacher, but a faithful preacher, because exactly. the goodness is always in God's hands. Uh, when when a sermon is received or when somebody says, wow, that was a, you know, that was such a good sermon, Joy, uh, that's God, that's the spirit, not, exactly. you know, not me. So I don't know that it, I think this parable does invite a little bit of pondering about the preaching task and, the, and our homiletical efforts. And, uh, and yeah, even Jesus threw around a lot of seed and it didn't. It didn't land very well. <laughs> and uh, the last couple of weeks, I've talked about context and threading and, you know, the series of preaching. What does a series of sermons do? And uh, this fits back all the way back two weeks ago uh, to what prophetic word is heard and what do we say about the God that we are offering and whether or not it's consistent. And it's the consistency that eventually becomes um, th th that that becomes the good the good the good word that is is heard, uh, because if it goes on bad soil, bad ground, bad you know the wind takes it away, 
what is given is what is consistent. And that's the truthful word about the God and God's promises, about the promises of God. And uh, and so it's, as you said, Caroline, it's the work of the Holy Spirit to bring that increase. Um, but are we being faithful? Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Of sowing the seeds. And sowing the seeds. I'm not I joking. think my approach to this is um, is maybe less about our preaching and less about our our ministry and 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 going back to kind of the context within the gospels and how in some ways this is explaining the 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 lack of popularity that Jesus is starting to experience and that's going that's going to increase mm-hmm. um, some of that comes from the verses that are omitted in ten through seventeen which which are uncomfortable verses. Um, but it's also like you said that there's a lot of there's a lot of a lot of the seed does not do what a farmer might hope it would do, mm-hmm. um, and it reveals uh, the, the the fate of the seed reveals something about right the the, the place in which it was sown, and so in that re- and there's other characters in the gospel that resemble all of these different things. Mm-hmm. In that regard, it. The, like the parable validates the power of persecution and the parable validates the power of anxiety. The parable validates the power of, of greed as, as obstacles to faith. Um, so part of me wants to spend some time with that, you know what I mean? As opposed to like, well, what guarantees the good soil, but also just uh, there are real threats that are beyond just agricultural here, but I, mm-hmm. you know, but apply to, to the life of faith. And so, um, you know, Caroline and I both, both had a teacher at various times in our lives who said, you, you can't tell people to be good soil. Right. Um, but you can talk about the ways in which a community of faith might be a bulwark against things like greed and anxiety and and the things that are that are toxic to faith. Um, it's a very individualistic parable in a lot of readings, right? What kind of soil am I? But to think about a community of faith as a field that contains all of these different kinds of soil and how is that community as a whole doing all it can to mitigate the 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 power of greed, that mitigate the power of anxiety. I don't know if I'm misreading it. That's kind of where my mind went this year uh, on this on this parable. Man, Maybe I wanna, because I'm greedy and anxious. Man, I want to highlight that you called this um, uh, the listener a community of faith. Um, sometimes we forget that scripture is written to the people of God about the people of God, that the central characters behind God and uh, God's promise uh, and how God's promise is made real are the people of God who are to be witnesses in the world to that promise. And so um, the fact that you stated it that way is significant because another way of reading this rather than reading it simply individual is to read it as if we in the church, in our community, in my tribe, my folks, we're the good soil in everybody else. Right. And the reality is um, Jesus's ministry at this point is among Israel. And among Israel, whether we're talking about the Pharisees or the farmers, are those who will get it and those who won't. And there's a con- con- continuity between um, who will receive the word uh, from two weeks ago's text uh, about who will welcome it. And there's also, as you've said, then that continuity of the message of Jesus and how Jesus will be received. And I, I really appreciate that you did that in terms of the community of faith. I think that's another reading that is worth our preaching, uh, our sermons um, being attentive to. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's a it's a community garden. <laughs> <laughs> nice. There we go. But I think the other thing too that we don't want to overlook is that 
it's, you know, at the end of the day, it's not just about the seed getting planted. It's also, it it's the bearing fruit, right? The yield. And so it's, uh, there's, there's life beyond the seed, <laughs> obviously, in that, you know, what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understand it, and then who indeed bears fruit and yields. Uh, and so it doesn't, it doesn't end with the seed. You don't get to just be a little seed in the ground and, you know, sit there and, and pop up and hope for the best. I mean, you, (laughs) you know, there's a. Caroline, are you saying that, uh, that unless a seed dies and goes into the ground it accomplishes nothing? Wait, what? Am I saying are you what? saying that unless a seed dies and goes into the ground, it accomplishes nothing? Are, are you are you weaving John into this? No, uh, no, 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 no. She is okay. it consciously, but I now thought that you I thought I heard it. a little echo there. Of, <laughs> but now that you mentioned it, now well, that you mentioned know, it, John has a seed metaphor that works a little differently. Yeah, I, I it I does. Heard an echo. No, but but you know what I mean. It's <laughs> it, that, that there's that 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 hearing. I think even though a quarter of of you know three quarters of the seeds don't produce produce that, that, that quarter of the seed produces 160 and 30 fold right and so there's uh which i mean i i think is a really good connection to the isaiah text i was um, just thinking that that's a wonderful <laughs> lead to the isaiah yeah. text <laughs> yeah but it's but you know the, I, maybe I'm like not making myself very clear, but it's 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 not just about the seed in the soil. It's what what is what is then produced. What is what is produced in your hearing? What will come from your hearing? Uh, and I think that's really a, a really important part of this parable as well. And and that hearing of the word. What what does it produce in you? What is the what is the yield? What results from it? What kind of fruit are you going to bear? Yeah. Having, and, having does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Having experienced grace, do you become grace filled? Yeah. Yeah. Do you demonstrate what you've experienced? Um and and we can linger with that, but I want to highlight something Matt often points to, and I just want to get a point for saying it this time. And at that point, particularly as we tie this to Isaiah, is that is what does this say about God? Because it's it's what God's grace being offered, if I stay with the metaphor that I use, it's what God has poured out. It is God's word that will not return empty. And, and and so Matt always uh, asks us, what does this say about God? And I think Isaiah's uh, text allows us to always do just that. that. <laughs> He's oh, always God. making it about God. Oh, so God. consistent he is. <laughs> I need a new shtick. I really, I really like sermons that just tell me how to how to live better. Yeah, that was sarcasm. I know that <laughs> that was yeah. heavy sarcasm. Yeah. yeah. That gets back to a former teacher as well who said, that's what we really need is just a lot more good moral effort. (laughs) He was also being sarcastic, but yeah. I was going to say, show me the evidence of that. Yeah, but the abundance and the abundance of the harvest and what, like what you said, Joy, I mean, what is it that, you know, you receive grace and then are you embodying grace? Going back to a couple of weeks ago, uh, you received that cold cup of water. And is that something that you extend to another? You, you are the, you are, uh, your yoke is, is kind and good. And so do you make that possible for others? And I, uh, and so that's, that's in part of this, you know, this, this harvest, it's also thinking about, uh, you know, what's, what's also around you that, uh, or, uh, maybe I'm going too far down the metaphor, but, um, metaphor, but you know, what's also around you that makes that, uh, that harvest abundant, uh, that makes your, that makes your yield more than you could possibly imagine. And it's mm-hmm. those, it's those, the, what surrounds you as well. Um, mm-hmm. and, uh, and there's the, there's the communal aspect. And I think too, the, you know, it takes a long time for 
plants to yield. That's the other thing. I mean, I think there's that I knew nothing about farming until my mother married a farmer and, 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 and then I was married to a, a, a man who grew up on a farm and I learned a lot and about, about farming, but the, uh, well, not, not a lot. I can't say that I learned a lot, but nonetheless, uh, but I think that the, also the, the expectation of yield is, is all, it takes a lot of patience too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so there's something here about that as well, that there's, that you that you're watching the corn grow, you're watching the beans grow, and it takes from May until September and October. Mm -hmm. And I, I think there's something there too in terms of the the immediate yield of hearing and understanding doesn't happen right away. Uh, I take it. What what other what other ways are we surrounding ourselves, and are how are we surrounding others that make for that yield to be more than we could possibly imagine. And, uh, and that it's not, and it, and it is not going to happen immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it, it takes tending and nurturing and consistency and watching and patience. And, and you know, what do you need now? You know, and a little more fertilizer, a little more anhydrous ammonia. I don't know. Yeah. That was some chemical that you put on the plants, but um, you know what I mean? Like, so no, you're that's in foreign language to me, but <laughs> No, you 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 absolutely I grew up around asphalt. Sorry. Well, so did I'm I. With you, Matt. I'm with you, Matt. No, no, you're absolutely right. And and again, this is a, a a similar word in terms of consistency of what is in Isaiah. Uh again, yeah. the same God uh in the Old Testament, the same promises, and even similar metaphors, uh, because we read Jesus's parable is talking about the word, the gospel, the good news, the promise of God being given and heard and received or not. And that's exactly what Isaiah is saying, using this metaphor um, um, if in our present moment uh, where uh, we've gone from drought uh, to floods because of the rain and the snow and the melting, uh, uh, particularly in the mountains and on the West Coast. Um, is that reality in terms of in God's time, um, what God puts forth uh, is going to accomplish what God intended. I'm back to God, uh, to, to, to put, putting God in the middle of this, Matt. Um, I'm but I'm it. also thinking of the text from the weeks before. If, if you were looking at the Old Testament text um, at, or rather than the gospel as you were preaching, and there's this similar thread of what you were just talking about, Caroline, in the sense of gardening, farming takes work and time and effort, and it doesn't just happen overnight. This promise of God, this reign of God, this righteousness of God, this goodness that has been promised to us leaves us in a liminal moment, somewhere between the planting and the watering and the full growth. And these both the uh, Isaiah text and the Matthew text describe that so that this God is faithful. And the question is, how are we preaching in such a way that our people can hear it in the liminal moment that they're in? And to be consistent with what we've said the last week, have the hope that is the promise of God. And Isaiah says what God's word will accomplish, what God's word is set out to do. And, some and when people say, you know, all weeds are valuable, they're just plants you don't like. I like to point out this verse here where God clearly thinks that we can do better than thorns and briars, which are weeds. Yes, God prefers the that. cypress and the myrtle. And myrtle is one of my favorite words to say and to spell. <laughs> All right, I have to tell we we have to go on, but I have to tell a quick story. So when Sig was <laughs> when Sig was born. Uh, and, and this was, this is my oldest son. And I remember, you know, and I was like, totally read all the books and all the new things that you should do as a parent and There's whatever. Good. And back in the day was, uh, you should teach your kids some signs like sign language and be, especially pre-verbal. And so you can actually, you know, have, have 
communicate with them. So that's what I did. So Sig would be sitting in his high chair and I, uh, and you know, he has whatever is, is on a high chair. And then I would go like more, more, this is more. And he looked at me like I had three heads, you know, he's like, what? And, and I tried it for two weeks. I went more, more, nothing, never, no response, nothing ever happened. And then two months later, he's sitting in his high chair, you know, eating an avocado or something. And I said, uh, and I said, do you, you know, do you want some more SIG? And he, and we went like this. <laughs> so yeah. see, like two months later, it, he, it, it clicked. So that's the, that's the more moral or not moral of the story. Summarizing. The, pa the yes. patience of having planted an idea, planted a seed. Yes. And how long it takes before <laughs> you see the fruit. Yeah. 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 No. Anyway, Genesis. We talked a lot about Matthew and it's a good We thing. did. We have. Uh, we have come to my favorite biblical character. I'm so happy. Jacob? Jacob. I love ah. Jacob. Hmm. Okay. Have you told us why before? Oh, yeah. We've been doing this for 15 years, haven't okay. we? Um, Remind well, me then. <laughs> Jacob's the trickster. Jacob's the one who um, is so determined to uh, to 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 extract <laughs> to get blessing from God that Jacob uh, <laughs> Jacob's not bound by any any sense of of. Uh, what's good for him and what's bad for him, or whatever. Jacob just goes out and gets it. And, uh, and God seems quite okay with that. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's something about Jacob. I, I don't think he's necessarily portrayed as, as morally bankrupt. Mm -hmm. I think he's, uh, I think God rewards him because there's just this deep drive to, um, to know and be known by God. So we'll get it this week. We'll get it in Bethel next week. We'll certainly get it on the shores of the Jabbok mm -hmm. when he's wrestling the way he contends with Laban is also, there's just, you know, he's got this classical trickster personality that, um, that as a younger brother in a family of two sons, I, I deeply admire. <laughs> <laughs> he knows ah, his brother's weaknesses now, and he exploits now, them. Now, now the yeah. truth comes out. Exactly. I also like the prodigal son much more than the the older brother when we get to Luke 15, <laughs> just so you all know. Just just so. Well, yeah. But, you know, it's also like a deeply dysfunctional family that we get introduced here as well, where the parents have already picked favorites and you just know this is not going to end well as also, you know. But I'm I'm going to I'm going to stay on the thread that I've tossed out uh, last week and just recognizing Rebecca. Um, uh, here we have Isaac praying to the Lord on her behalf because she was barren and, uh, that she also, uh, inquires of God and God converses with her to explain to her the circumstances that are about to be her life. I mean, this isn't just, you know, this, this pregnancy seems hard because you're having twins, but, um, and like you, like you just described, Matt, um, this is the way families are. They're not perfect. Um, dysfunctional seems to be the normal for the way that our families uh, live. And we're not the first generation um, to experience that reality. Um, but as I said last week, Rebecca continues to be present in the midst of this, even as we shift uh, to Jacob. And here we have that favorite son. Um, Isaac loved um, Esau, but Re Rebecca loved Jacob. And what it means when you have this uh, parenting spar between one another, it's kind of nice that the triune God um, in the oneness that we don't understand loves us <laughs> all equally. Um, um, it's one of those uh, contrasts between the frailty and brokenness of humanity and the consistency and promise of God. Uh, but I do want to keep that thread alive, uh, that Rebecca is here, that Rebecca loves Jacob, who's going to be the prominent son here, and that Rebecca particularly, God talks with Rebecca. This is a scene. 
where God doesn't just have a moment conversation about the situation she's in, but a foretaste of what her life is going to be. I think that's worth highlighting. Great. Good. Good for me. I, yeah. I, <laughs> yeah, I, I was trying to think of the word, uh, a word that I would use uh, when you were talking about Jacob, Matt, and it's not really persistence. It's not that it's um, it's kind of persistence, but it's it a kind of, yeah, like a stick determined. to it. What's that? Determined. I'm going to get this promise. Yeah. Kind of a determination or, and you know, uh, when is it that, that our lives of faith are need some of that, um, need that kind of, uh, that kind of determination, that kind of persistence, that kind of, um, yeah, that's, there's something, yeah, something there that I think is worth pursuing homiletically. He doesn't it, take no or wait as an answer. Yeah. You know? There's yeah. something about yeah, that. that yeah. It could be deeply annoying in some settings, but with God, it's about let's unlock the blessing right now. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in that with God, in that it there is that trust of God that we talked about a couple of couple of weeks ago. Is this God trustworthy? Jacob seems to say, I'm gonna hold on. I mean, I, I'm getting ahead of ourselves, but it's his it's the consistence or the persistence of his personality. I'm gonna hold on, God, until you give me what you promised. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The problem, of course, it's a it's a zero sum, right? So that Jacob's gain becomes Esau's loss. And that's, you know. Yeah. Other biblical passages will help us maybe push back against that. But but Esau also despised his birthright. There's a criticism of Esau going on here. Esau doesn't realize how good he's got it. He yeah. takes it for granted. And yeah. that's also a, a parable about faith. Uh, the psalm, I would weave into what we talked about with Matthew, um, particularly those last verses, right? You crown the year with your bounty your wagon tracks overflow with richness. I mean, there's, I think the language there that you can bring in with, with that yield and bearing fruit that the Psalm, the Psalmist provides that language. That's both, it. Both that, with the Matthew, both with the Matthew text or the Isaiah text. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, that's all. And maybe given the way that we've just talked about Jacob, you know, that's the, that's the blessing that Jacob is pursuing. Uh, that's the promise that is fulfilled um, where um, Isaac has prayed for his barren wife. So I, I guess it, it fits there too. Yeah, yeah. And remember this whole this whole this this whole covenant, this whole blessing is is looking forward to the whole earth being blessed. I mean, yes. Yeah, Jacob might have something in it for himself, but the the overriding vision is still this is going to be blessing that spills over to many others and i mean you kind of see that and i think in jacob's own story although i recognize there's a, a lot wrong with the story of, of leah and rachel when we get to those two and the the way they're pitted against each other but anyway complicated book that genesis yes that genesis. <laughs> complicated people not unlike us that's right yeah. that's right uh romans 8 one through 11. There's really not much here that preaches. I don't know what a preacher would do with this. Yeah, we just talked about these con con people we want to condemn, and then we find out that in Christ <laughs> there is no condemnation. Wow. How do you preach about that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Such a high point for the letter. This is obviously, you know, where the Holy Spirit gets not introduced, but kind of becomes prominent as, as what, what does the life of faith look like? But also, so this doesn't get lost in platitudes or, or general generalizations. Some of the things Paul talks about, uh, verse six, right? To set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. Yeah. It's a little more specific there because it'd still be kind of general. But notice where the letter is going to go. He's going to spend all of chapter 14 and part of 15 talking about um, a community that's able to hold together despite different dietary scruples. Um mm -hmm. So what does it look like for what appears to be a pretty diverse community, as as you could measure that in the ancient world in Rome, or a, a diverse collection of house churches 
what would life and peace look like for those communities? So I think in some ways he's he's starting to prepare for where the letter is going to go later on, that the spirit is about more than just good feelings for ourselves and more than just a pledge of our belonging to God, which of course the spirit is, but the spirit generates a community that's able to be abundant uh, and living and life-giving. Mm -hmm. Well, and I, I think in particular, you have these uh, in, in this passage, the two occurrences in verses nine and 11 of the NRSV translates it, you know, the spirit, the spirit of Christ dwells in you. But it's, uh, as the commentary points out, it makes a home, oikao. Mm -hmm. uh, the spirit is making a home in you. And um, and it's not not made a home, but it's present tense indicative. You are in the spirit and the spirit is making a home in you. And, uh, you know, there, there's so many different ways. One of the things that I think is uh, I talk, we talk a lot about with our students, right, Joy, is the the way in which we, and we talk about this in the podcast, the way in which there's not a uniform pneumatology, there's not a uniform soteriology, like what is a particular text saying about the spirit or what is it, you know, salvation or whatever. And this, this idea of the, the spirit making a home in you um, is really powerful and how that might be an image that would really resonate with people as you think about how do people imagine what the spirit does and what the spirit is and how the, how is a spirit present in their lives? And so that making a home, I think you could really, really unpack that, I, that image in a way that could be, uh, I, I think could be really meaningful for people to imagine the presence of the spirit in their lives in a way that's really intimate and, yeah. uh, and, and, uh, yeah, really intimate and and just yeah, so close that I don't know. I, you're I sounding um, you're sounding kind of Wesley in there, Caroline. <laughs> slips out every one going to a Methodist school. It slips out every once in a while. Every Joy. once in a while, yeah. We 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 planted that seed. <laughs> <laughs> just right. had to wait Ooh, for nice it. To, to, <laughs> yeah, like I a, yeah. I often, uh, Caroline, you know, I like to do um, uh, with our students uh, when we talk about um, looking for illustrations, looking for um, stories to tell that illustrate the point. Um, and I always like to weave in scripture. And uh, so um, if you're preaching Romans here, um, what you get in this story of Jacob and Esau um, becomes a perfect illustration of what it means to have your mind set on the flesh and your mind set on the promises of God. And this is one where you can actually use the Old Testament people and their uh, the episodes of their life to illustrate what uh, would be in the imagination of a first century Jew who would know this history, would know the those scriptures as they're getting this letter from Paul, who also would know that. And um, it also is a way for us to um, make sure that that Old Testament lesson is known, even if we're not preaching uh, from that text, to actually use that as the illustration of what does it look like when um, our mind is not set on the things of God, but set a, according to uh, a living according to the flesh. Um, but it also uh, helps us realize, I would like to say jokingly again, that we might be glad the canon is closed because when we do use ourselves, our family or our friends uh, to illustrate a point, save YouTube and um, those recordings, that's not going to be eternal scripture. And um, this is how we remember Jacob and Esau for better or for worse. <laughs>